Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, on this 34th Sunday in ordinary time, the last Sunday of the liturgical year, we celebrate the solemnity of Christ the King. In fact, we are climbing the pinnacle of the liturgical year. The second reading of this solemnity comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 5 to 8. The lesson reads thus, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. There are three types of literary genre found in the book of Revelation. Letter, prophecy and apocalypse. The literary type of this book is a mixture of this literary genre. In the first three chapters of this letter, especially chapters 2 and 3, the literary type is that of letter. In the chapters 2 and 3, we read seven letters addressed to seven churches. But it is in chapter 1 verses 4 to 6 that we hear the prescript or the opening formula of these letters. The opening formula, as was the Greco-Roman practice of the time, included the names of the sender and addressee and then greetings. In our reading today, we hear a portion of the prescript in verses 5 and 6. The rest, verses 7 and 8, carry two prophetic sayings. Now here, the greetings come from Jesus Christ, as seen in verses 5 and 6. The three titles given here to Christ speak of his relation to the community of the faithful. First, he is the faithful witness. Second, the firstborn from the dead. And third, the ruler of the kings of the earth. By calling Jesus the faithful witness, John, the seer of this book, puts forth Jesus as a model to be imitated. In the book as a whole, faithfulness on the part of the audience is advocated as a primary value that should characterize their lives. This is because the background of the book is persecution and some of the believers are prone to leave the faith due to the difficulties and the hardships they had to face upon embracing this new kind of faith. The Greek term for witness, martyrs, may already carry the connotation of dying, that is, witnessing by death, which may be required to remain faithful. If the term did not have that meaning at that time, the author is already taking a major step in that direction. The second title, The Firstborn from the Dead, designates the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is the event that has inaugurated the new age. It's a sign that the time of crisis has dawned. By his resurrection, he has become the Lord of life. He is the basis or foundation for the life of all, that is, the enduring or eternal life of every person. Hence, through Jesus, everyone can live with hope, the hope that there will be the fullness of life hereafter. The title, The Ruler of the Kings of the Earth, is all the more important. That is also one of the reasons why this portion of the text is used on the solemnity of Christ the King. The resurrection of Jesus is equivalent to his installation as the Universal King. 
St. Paul would speak of it in his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 20 to 28. In the context in which the book of Revelation was written, this last title invites readers to a contest because of its strongly political content. In the midst of the Roman Empire in which the Christian communities resisted giving ceremonial worship to the emperor, the title is a provocation because it affirms that Caesar too is subservient to Christ, the one and only supreme ruler of the kings of the earth. Affirming the victory of Christ assures the victory of Christians as well. Next, the author describes the three activities of Christ on behalf of his community, or more properly, on behalf of humanity. This is at first he who loves us, and that in the present tense. It's an ever-present love. It's this love that unites the church and constitutes the church. From this love there springs forth the second work for humanity, freed us from our sins by his blood. The precise wording of this phrase is unique in the New Testament here. But the basic idea is already there in the early Christian tradition as seen in Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 26 and Galatians 2:20. The third aspect of Jesus' work is that he made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father. It means that Jesus' work fulfilled the promise of Exodus chapter 19 verse 6, making us a kingdom of priests serving his God and Father. All those who hear and obey God's word are priests, that is mediators between God and the rest of humanity. The priestly service of Christians does not consist in a ceremonial ministry or playing a liturgical role, but rather of putting oneself at the service of life or at the service of others. This little phrase stands as one of the bases for the concept of the common priesthood or royal priesthood of the people of God. It was the Second Vatican Council that spoke insistently of the common priesthood of the people of God. On this feast in which we proclaim the kingship of Christ, it's more than fitting that we insist on the royal priesthood of the people of God, so that all are reminded of the fact that they should become servants of one another. At the end of the verse here, the author ascribes to Christ glory and dominion on account of these titles and his work for the whole humanity. There follow then two prophetic sayings in verses 7 and 8. The first saying in verse 7 combines the predictions of Daniel chapter 7 verse 13 and Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10, interpreted as the prophecies of the return of the risen Lord as judge. It is said that every eye will see him. It means that he will become the Lord of history. It's thus he has become the king of kings. In verse 8, the Lord God Almighty speaks, I am the Alpha and the Omega. This statement could be said to be the summary of the whole book of Revelation. It means that in spite of all kinds of persecution, conflict and trouble, it's God who will say the first word and the last word relating to this universe. This is what is signified by saying that God is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabetical system. No other power can determine the fate of this universe, of humanity, of all other realities. No other power has the right and the power to do it. Dear friends, we have today very inspiring and consoling words from the book of Revelation on this solemnity of Christ the King. We are invited to become the witnesses of Christ, to be witnesses even paying the greatest cost of our lives too. We are all his priests, ones who will realize that by becoming servants of one another. Persecution and suffering do not constitute the last word. The last word will be said by God and his Christ, 
and it will be a word of consolation and of joy amen